Of your circumcision when you were given the name Jesus, which means God saves. Make us worthy to celebrate this feast with joy and with gladness. We ask you through the intercession of the great saints Basil and Gregory to bless our new year with your peace and blessings. By your birth you gave peace and good hope to all. To you be glory, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Father who gave us his only begotten Son, full of grace and truth, and to the Son who fulfilled the law of circumcision in the flesh and replaced it with holy baptism to purify the body and the spirit, and to the Holy Spirit who gives us the knowledge of the law of the Lord and renews us. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. Glory to you, O only begotten Word of God, born of the Father before all ages. At the appointed time you chose to take flesh and to be born of the Virgin Mary so that we might be born in the Spirit. Eight days after your birth you observed the law of circumcision when you were given the name Jesus so that we might observe the law of baptism that you established for our sanctification and renewal. Now, Christ our God, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense that whenever we call upon your holy name, we may be filled with serenity, calm, and peace. Bless our new year, that the kingdom of justice, charity, and peace may rule the world. Remember all those who struggle and who suffer for this new kingdom, which treats all people of every race and tongue as brothers and as sisters. Confirm your church in the faith of the great saints Basil and Gregory and send us holy teachers like them, so that with the angels we may sing glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and good hope to all forever.
Lord Jesus, accept this incense that we have offered to you at the beginning of this new year, on this feast of your circumcision, through the intercession of the great saints Basil and Gregory, grant us times of prosperity, blessings, and peace, that we may raise glory to you, now and forever. Amen. Kadi shantaloho, Kadi shant, Hayalato no Kadi shant, give the Lord praise for he chose to be circumcised. All you peoples, praise the Lord God, fulfiller of the law of old. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish, and to children forever. Brothers and sisters, therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by those called the circumcision, which is done in the flesh by human hands, were at that time without Christ, alienated from the community of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, 
You once were far off, have become near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, he who made both one, and broke down the dividing wall of enmity through his flesh, abolishing the law with its commandments and legal claims, that he might create in himself one new person in place of the two, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile both with God in one body through the cross, putting that enmity to death by it. He came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the Holy Ones and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the capstone. Through him, the whole structure is held together and grows in a temple sacred in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Praise be to God always. Alleluia. of the gospel of our Saviour announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint Luke, the proclaim life unto the world. Let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The evangelist Luke writes, And when eight days were completed for his circumcision, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days were completed for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they took him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, just as it is written, in the law of the Lord, every male that opens the womb shall be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer the sacrifice of a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons, in accordance with the dictate in the law of the Lord. This is the truth, peace be with you.
But now in Christ Jesus, you once who were once far off have been brought near through the blood of Christ. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. We have to actually look at this whole chapter to actually understand the text as we're having it read, because we're reading just in that you have today in the bulletins is just the second half of chapter two of the Ephesians. But the whole chapter is about how God's work is actually to form one body, one new man, as he says. It's the new Adam, it's the new creation, it's the new body that we call the church. But he also talks about his being that you are being put together as stones, building into one living temple, which is the dwelling place of God. St. Peter will pick up this same image again in his letters, speaking of us being living stones. But of course, stones, when they are put into a temple, they are chiseled, they are sanded, they are hammered. And it's important that we realize that that's the full imagery of saying we are living stones of the living temple of God. So that the one hand, it is a great movement of unity and peace, so that those who were far have been brought to be near and to be brought in the peace into the one body of Christ. But it also means that the process is hammering and chiseling and sanding. And hence, it's linked together with the reason why it's chosen. It's linked to the circumcision. Circumcision and faith are being contrasted in this chapter. Circumcision is something that's done to someone, to a man from the outside, by someone. Whereas faith is something that God does within the individual interiorly. These are two very different things. Faith is the path that has always been God's program, not circumcision. Circumcision actually predates Abraham. Abraham is told to use circumcision as a sign of the covenant that he makes with God, that God makes with him in the promises. But it's something that already exists. It's a bit like the rainbow in the flood of Noah. The rainbow has always existed. It's a refraction of light by water vapor, not a big deal. The rainbow always existed after rain. But God takes that as a sign after the flood and said, when you see this, know that this perpetual sign now means I will not destroy humanity again. So he takes something that pre-exists and makes it into a sign for the people of that moment, in this case, Abraham and the promise. Moses institutes it as part of the law, but it already dates from centuries before with Abraham and even predates Abraham. It's still practiced by pagan nations in Africa. It's just always been around. Why? Who knows? It's very strange. But it's something that has been done. And this aspect then, why we say in the Masmurdo, we praise the God who comes and who chooses to be circumcised because what he's doing this child that is born and on the eighth day embracing circumcision, first is the first chiseling, right? In the sense, there is blood that is drawn. It is the beginning, which is why in all of the traditions of the church, all of the churches make reference to our Lord's crucifixion at Christmas. Because he takes a body in order to die ultimately for us and for our salvation. And so the circumcision is the beginning of the shedding of the precious blood. But it is also the embracing of the eternal one who enters into the law of Moses, submits himself to it in order to shatter it from the inside out. He embraces it, is subjected to it, but in order that faith will be brought in. So you see it being linked to baptism in our prayers today. Because faith is the actual path by which God desires us to move. Because faith is what is loyalty interiorly. So you'll notice in our anaphoras, we often make reference to those who are far and to those who are near. It doesn't mean they've gone on vacation. It means they have heard the gospel. Now, those who are far and those who are near in this epistle today refer to the Gentiles who were outside of Israel. But now in the Christian dispensation, those who are far either mean people who are just completely pagan and have never heard the gospel, or those who have heard the gospel and have dropped that loyalty. 
who do not respond, who do not practice, who do not live that faith, and in doing so, they make themselves far. And so, therefore, so often in the Anaphoras, we pray for those who are far that they be brought back, that they be brought near, that they enter back into the mysteries by which faith is responded to, faith is nourished and expanded for the building up of the living temple of God. So, if we look at this whole chapter, St. Paul begins this chapter by saying, all of us are a mess both Jews and Greeks, Jews and Gentiles were all a mess. So when you just have the reading we have today, it sounds like it's just about Gentiles. But in fact, the whole chapter, because St. Paul says that we the Jews also followed the flesh. We simply followed and responded to the laws of nature and lived by the laws of nature as everyone else. He says at the beginning of the chapter, we were children of rebellion like everyone else. They may be pagans, we were Jews, we were under the law of Moses, and we were still self-centered, calculating, manipulative, make things work the way I want them to work. And he says we were all children of, of, of rebellion. And he says, therefore, as the result of that, there is no peace. We are always at ill at ease. And he says we were children of wrath. In other words, because we're not living the way God wants us to live, there is displeasure from God. Not that he's going to smack us around. It's our harm being done to us. It doesn't harm God at all. It harms us. But that is the terminology that we use of the anger of God or the wrath of God. We are the ones who generate that and who sustain it. God's not personally upset. Doesn't faze him at all. So, this aspect, he says in, in verse 14, he says, for he is our peace who made the two. Now he's talking about those who are far, those who are near, the Israel and the Gentiles, who made the two into one, breaking down the barrier of hostility. Now at the beginning of the text that you have today, he says, you were Gentiles. He's writing to the Ephesians. You were Gentiles. You were nation. You were non-Israelites. And you are called uncircumcised by those who call themselves circumcised. That was the worst thing. They just say they're uncircumcised. They're dirty. They eat pork, right? That kind of an idea. When you have these dietary laws and these prescriptions in your head, they're dirty by the fact that they don't do this. And so he says, you were Gentiles in the flesh, called uncircumcised, separated from Christ, excluded from the community of Israel, and you were foreigners to the covenants of the promise. And he makes covenants plural. Because he's, spoken, he's speaking about the relation and the covenants that are made between God and Abraham, between God and Moses on Mount Sinai, and between God and King David for the descendants of the coming of the Messiah of the Davidic line. And he says, you Gentiles, you non-Israelites, you didn't have any of that. And so he goes on and he says, and therefore you are in this world without hope and without God. That is a very severe phrase because he's saying, where is God working? Until the time of the coming of this child, where was God working personally? In Israel. Of course, God is God is governing everything, but personally intervening and directing and guiding and teaching the prophets and all of that, the promises, Israel. Therefore, you non-Israelites, you had nothing. You were foreigners, you were excluded, you were without hope, and you were without God. And then he says, but God, but Christ is our peace. And he has brought the two into one, breaking down the barrier of hostility. Now when he says this, what barrier is he talking about? Because he's going to use this idea of barrier on several occasions in the letter to the Hebrews and here. When he's talking about the barrier, we've discussed this before, the temple complex in Jerusalem. So you have the large complex, you can still see part of it to this day, the Wailing Wall, the one western wall that was left, and it was left there on purpose by the Romans because they wanted to make sure you saw the ruins. And so that was left there actually as a condemnation. I mean, the Jews pray in front of it now, but the Romans distinctly left it 
there to show we could have torn it all down. We left one segment of one retaining wall, so you will remember. That's how horrible this is. But on top, of course, is the whole complex. And the complex, that's the temple that our Lord enters into, turning over tables and the money changers and chasing everyone out doing their merchandising for the temple. Because there was a market in this area. That's the large esplanade. The large esplanade everyone could go to. Then you had a wall that went around the outside of the temple that inside you had what was called the court of Israel, then you had the place of the priest, and then the temple itself with the holy, of ho the holy place and the holy of holies. But the wall went around all of this area because no one was allowed to enter into that immediate proximity to the temple unless they were a Jew. And Josephus in the first century writes about saying, and it was considered a capital crime. If a non-Israelite went into that area, he would be arrested and then put to death. And that Rome authorized and recognized that capital crime. Because remember, under the Roman Empire, nobody could be ex executed except by the Roman authority. All these other nations could govern themselves and direct themselves and have their own laws, but none of the nations in the empire could execute anyone without the authorization of the Roman authority. This is why when you read about our Lord's Passion, it's so complex. You have the Sanhedrin, but they have to go to Pontius Pilate because they can't kill our Lord. They can't execute our Lord without Roman authority. So when people would read this in Josephus, they would say, this is absurd. The Romans wouldn't have put to death someone just because they weren't an Israelite. And a lot of commentators just said, Josephus is just exaggerating. Until the 1920s and the excavations that go on stop forever in Jerusalem because there's so much history there, they found part of the ruins of the temple that the Romans had pulled down in the first century and they found part of the architrave that ran around that had the, has the inscription on it in large letters warning all non-Israelites from going into this inner precinct. So it was not only the law and was recognized, it was carved on the very building itself, telling you non-Israelites, you cannot come beyond this barrier. This is the barrier that St. Paul is talking about in the epistle today, that there was a barrier dividing the two. And what he says is the Christ coming as man, the new man that's being created, the body of Christ, the church, Christ comes, subjects the law, is circumcised, and in his very humanity is going to break down. As, as a Jew in his incarnation under the law of Moses, born of the Mary of Nazareth, he's going to take in his flesh the very physicality and shatter it by being torn apart on Mount Calvary. And so St. Paul in the letter to the Hebrews would say, we have a living veil that has been opened to us. The barrier is a living barrier. It has been torn down and we enter into the living barrier, which is Christ himself, the living temple, to become living stones. It's a very beautiful image, but it's very intense. And so this tearing down of the barrier, he says, he does in his flesh. So if he's going to chisel us and sand us and polish these living stones, on the Feast of the Circumcision, we stop for a moment and pause and to realize he did this to himself first so that we may find that peace and that living reality. That is the idea when our Lord says to carry your cross daily. And so he brings this whole, this whole chapter together is meant to be brought together in verses four and seven. You don't have it in the epistle, but it's at the beginning because he announces and says that God is rich in mercy and he has raised us up and brought us into life together with Christ. And this in the Greek is magnificent because you know St. Paul makes a lot of neologisms. He makes up words because there's things that he wants to say that the language does not allow him to express. And this is one of them. So we translate it being quickened or being made enlivened in Christ, together with Christ. That's actually one verb. 
He's making us together living, to together living in Christ. This idea that the same life that is given, St. Paul wants to express it, the exact same life of the resurrection that Christ brings into this world is exactly the same life, not shared with us, but the exact same life given to us that we are made to be raised up and brought into the same life as Christ enthroned with him at the right hand of the Father, seated in heavenly places. This is exceptionally beautiful. This is the contemplation of Christmas. Why does this child enter into the world that allows us, in order to allow us to ultimately be by our baptism and our faith enthroned with him at this moment at the right hand of the Father. This is not something promised for the future. St. Paul says, this is the reality now. We already have one foot at the right hand of the Father because God is good. And because God is merciful, he's brought this to us. And then he goes on immediately to say, but this is a gift. You didn't do anything for this. You didn't merit this in any way. This is a gift. This is what we mean when we talk about grace and grace and grace. The word grace just means gift. And so St. Paul says, well, remember, this is God's initiative. This is God's working. This is God's doing. This is God's promise. So respond love for love. Respond by being merciful because you have received mercy first. This is the whole Christian ethos. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And so faith comes down to that aspect of our reaction to what God does in this world, what God is doing within our personal lives. And therefore, when we don't respond, we just walk away. That's to make ourselves far. Right? We've used that image, you know, in the family, where someone gets really ticked off at you. So their idea is they're just going to give you the cold shoulder and walk away. You see that all the time in families. And it drives people up the wall. It's aggravating. It's insulting. Because they won't communicate. So St. Paul is saying, this is what faith is. Do we like God chiseling my life? No. Do I like God sanding and coming and saying, oh, there's birds on this side of the stone? So hold on, because here we go. This will be the next two years of your life. And no, we don't like this. But we have to know that it comes from the loving hand of infinite wisdom. And when we understand that, Paul, St. Paul says, you will persevere to the end. You will not make yourselves far. You will always remain near. Because that faith is God's work within us, transforming us interiorly, so that he finishes this whole chapter. He's saying, so realize the very fact that right now, at this moment, you are co-citizens with the saints in heaven. You already have an existence which is not here, which is not worried about the hangover on the morning of New Year's Day. No, you don't live in that world. You only have one foot in that world. The world that you are is co-citizens with the saints in heaven. You are members of God's household. You are members of his family. Already, now at this point, and you are being built up into the temple of God the living temple where God finds his dwelling upon the earth. So where does God act personally now? In your life and in your life and in your families. That is where God operates in that extension that we call church, in that body of Christ. And so in the moment when the sanding blocks come down and the hammers and the chisels come out in our lives, always remember this mercy. Always remember that the one who holds that hammer and chisel is our peace. And when we do that, it doesn't take away the pain. That's for sure. But it does give meaning, and it does make us understand that there is a profound purpose to this living reality. And so on this first day of a new year, God be praised for his mercy in doing the things that he does in our lives so that others ultimately can receive the same mercy and peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, 
God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men, for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in the accordance of the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is Lord and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, Saint Basil, and Saint Gregory Nazianzen. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
St. John Chrysostom on page 876, 876. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God and Father, holy and glorious is your name. You deliver those who love you from all that is contrary to your will. May we who have remained in your divine love be made worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with a holy kiss. May we always speak words of peace, think of peace, and work for peace. Through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, we raise glory to you and to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. Peace. Love and faith, brothers and sisters. O Lord, on all hidden from all creation, you are peace, reconciling those who are enemies. You are forgiveness to those who sin, and you are comfort to those who are sorrowful. Open the door of your mercy to our petitions, and in the abundance of your grace, accept our prayers. Make us children and heirs of your kingdom, through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, and through your Holy Spirit, now and forever. you are adored by all angels bless you humanity exalts you and all creation glorifies you look upon your children who call out to you with purity and holiness may we offer you an acceptable sacrifice that we may that we may raise glory to you to your only son and to your holy spirit now and forever grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence, and worship him with humility. It is right and just. Truly it is right and just to thank, adore, glorify, and bless the majesty of the one consubstantial Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a majesty that does not need our glory or become greater with our thanks. O Lord, those who sing your praises are countless, and they cry out with angelic voices and with sweet melodies proclaiming. Truly he is the son of your majesty. He willingly became man to make us divine. He was born from a woman's womb. 
that we may be born again from the spiritual womb. He became our brother so that through his grace we may become your children and heirs. He took us from being slaves and made us your children. He promised us a share in the reward that allows us to call you Abba. He cleansed us from our sins with his precious blood that he poured out for us. For he is your only son. Kurie eleison. And Do this in memory of me. Each time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember my death until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. O Word of God, who can comprehend that you willingly emptied yourself of your divine glory, who can explain your miraculous birth from a virgin, who can repay you for your saving passion which you freely endured, who can praise your plan of salvation for us. We can only ask of you, a lover of all people, that this sacrifice which we have offered be accepted on your altar in heaven, the dwelling place of your hidden divinity, in the company of all the angels and saints. Through this sacrifice, may we be worthy of the forgiveness of our sins. When you come to judge the living and the dead, do not pass judgment upon us, nor deny us, saying, I do not know you. On that glorious and fearful day, do not separate us from you, nor cast us out of your paradise to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Rather, because of your holy name by which we have been called, look with mercy upon us. In your compassion you have made us worthy of the gift of your forgiving body and blood. So make us worthy to be one with you in holiness as you are one with your Father. For this your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father saying, sinful children for receive your graces we thank you for them and because of them we praise you we bless you we adore you we glorify you we confess our faith in you and we ask you they become the one body of us have mercy on us and hear us how awesome is this moment of my for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our 
our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Anin monio, anin monio, anin monio, nite let this brand the body of Christ our God be for us a pledge of the life to come a body that grants us the everlasting joys of heaven, a body that renews our souls and bodies, the body that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. And that the mixture in this chalice, the blood of Christ our God, be a blood that gives new life to those who receive it, a blood that guides us to the safe harbors and the dwellings of light. A blood that renews our souls and bodies, a blood that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. O Lord, in your great mercy, when this body and blood is mingled with our bodies and souls, grant that it may be for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and for the everlasting joy and eternal life with all your saints. Amen. Offer you, Lord God, this pure and holy offering for your holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, which you have redeemed. Grant her children, gather her children into unity, charity, and faith, and guide them in peace and security. We offer it for the pure bishops of the true faith, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, the Venerable Priest, the Chaste Deacons, the pure subdeacons, and all the orders of the church. Teach them the word of truth, so that they may spread it faithfully. With justice and holiness, may they care for the flock that you have entrusted to them. Give them the proper means to accomplish your will, and grant them a long life. We pray to you, O Lord. For the poor and the dejected, for orphans and widows, for the sick and the distressed, and for those tempted by evil spirits, be the guardian and refuge of their lives. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Remember the Holy Fathers, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, and confessors especially the holy, glorious, and blessed ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, St. John the Baptist, the, the messenger and forerunner, who witnessed the betrothal of your holy church to your son, glorious St. Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, and all who pleased you and professed your name. We pray to you, O Lord. faithful departed who have gone to you from this altar and from every place throughout the world. Grant them rest in your heavenly dwellings with all your saints, and in your mercy forgive our sins and theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed with or without full knowledge. Do not deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions, hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you and join us to your righteous ones and to those who have done your will, that in all and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever.
the pleasing oblation, who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice, who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest, who offered yourself as the Lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you be glory forever. O Lord, our Lord, you sent us your only Son, who is the radiance of your eternity. And he accomplished his plan of salvation for us, that we may come to you. May we call upon you with the prayer that he taught his holy disciples, as saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of thy Lord, now and forever. Yes, O merciful Lord, we ask for your compassion. By your grace, make us worthy that your glorious name may be made holy in us, that your kingdom come to assist us in our weakness, and that your will dwell within us. Deliver us from all difficult temptations. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo el Kurfunna. O Lord God, you are good and the lover of all people. Look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty and bless them with every spiritual blessing. Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts, and let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your only Son. Rather, make us worthy to share in your holy and life-giving mysteries with purity, that we may raise glory and thanks to you to your only Son, and to your good and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Let each, one, Spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask Him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth, to Him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by Your holy body, and our souls purified by Your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, O compassionate and merciful one. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus, you have made us worthy to share in your holy body and in the cup of salvation. How can we repay you for these, your gifts and graces, and for your goodness? As you have called us to approach this life-giving banquet, make us worthy, so that your body may be mingled with our bodies and your blood with our souls, for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and for eternal life. You are blessed and your kingdom is holy. And we raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo el-Kulchunna.
God the Father, we bow before you and we entrust ourselves to your care. We ask you, imploring your mercy, to rest your right hand full of blessings upon us. Assist us, protect us, bless us, and sanctify us by the cross of your only Son. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. So I certainly wish you all a most blessed new year of grace. May it be filled with God's choicest blessings in the one who is our peace throughout all the months of this coming year. Under, of course, the patronage of St. Basil and St. Gregory Nazians. And may you find abundance and life as living stones in the temple of God. So go in peace. Oh. And the, the Maronite calendars are at the door, so make sure you grab them as you go out. So next year's, this year's Maronite calendars. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Leave you in peace on the altar of God. Joy to the world, the Lord is mine. Let us worship.